Good evening and Chag Sameach, uh, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I hope you all had a peaceful and healthy beginning to Pesach and that you were able to enjoy the beginnings of the Chol HaMoe days as well. We begin, as we have with all of these Zooms, with our wishes and prayers for all those who are sick and need a refuah shleima. Our prayers are with you and your families. And condolences to all those that have lost loved ones in the past days and weeks. We salute and thank the medical and frontline professionals who are caring for the sick, and we want them to know how appreciative and proud we are of what they are doing each and every day. Thank you. We want to recognize some of our alumni who have had smachot this past uh, few days, these past few days. We'll start with Erica Schachter Schwartz and Rob Schwartz on Lily's Bat Mitzvah, which is a beautiful affair, and then David Hiltzik and Aviva Preminger on Nathan's Bar Mitzvah that was actually just this morning. That's Matthew's nephew, so a mazel tov to Matthew as well. Miriam Goldwasser and Paul Peskowitz on their new granddaughter born the first night of Pesach. So that's a great piece of news. And Amanda Glaubach and Joshua Rothkin on their new baby daughter, Aviva Chaya Sienna Rose, who I think was just born yesterday, uh, in, in, in yesterday morning. And now, to the reason we are here this evening, uh, our very own alumnus, Matthew Hiltzik, uh, CEO of Hiltzik Strategies, helped to put tonight's Zoom together. His company, Hiltzik Strategies, provides advice and counsel <clears throat> to leading business executives, institutions, and influencers in finance, in sports, in technology, media and entertainment, education, public affairs, and philanthropy. Matthew has been a great resource for the Ramaz, KJ, and greater Jewish community as well. He is someone that we take a lot of pride in in the Ramaz community, and we are so proud to have him with us to moderate tonight's program. Um, before I hand the Zoom over to Matthew, I just want to thank Jeremy Schapp. Uh, Jeremy, thank you for joining us on the Zoom this evening. Thank you for Throughout having your careers, Jeremy, I know that you've been such an amazing mensch, and we want to recognize that as well because that's such an important part of who we are as a community and why it's so appropriate to have you on as well this evening. I want to remind you that tonight, the only ones that will be seen and heard are Jeremy and Matthew going forward. And so you're on mute and your videos are off, but if you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And as Matthew moderates the evening, he will go down to the Q&As, take some of the questions and pose them to Jeremy as part of the evening's program. And so I thank you all again for being here this evening. A good moi to everybody. Matthew, it's all yours. Great, thank you so much. So first, thank you, Kenny. Thank you, Leah, and everybody uh, involved with the school. Uh, everyone at Ramaz, we know the administration and everyone is are working really hard to try to keep things together. Uh, we have the two week period now where the kids do not have class. So hopefully the teachers are getting some break, um, but we really appreciate everything that everyone's been doing to, to keep things together. Um, and uh, just also a, uh, a special shout out to Matt Kandel, who our, uh, our uh, middle school athletic director, who since we're talking about the world of sports, he, he has left two of his teams, uh, the girls uh, seventh and eighth grade and the boys eighth grade in positions of being uh, top seeds and that are left in each of their leagues. So in the playoffs that may or may not ever have a chance, but um, I'm very proud of the athletic program here just as Jeremy and I are very proud of the athletic program at, at Cornell, where our men's and women's hockey teams finished at number one rank in the country also uh, of being in a place where we uh, hopefully can at least cherish the fact that they, they, were, number, they were both number one, which, which rarely happened. Uh, Jeremy and I first met at Cornell. I was a freshman. He was a senior. We met for a little while then, uh, writing for the Cornell Daily Sun. Uh, Jeremy went on to do great things of establishing uh, himself as being one of the premier 
sports journalist. Uh, he's somebody who uh, he's an author. Uh, just he under he he understands the world of documentaries and film and uh, being a uh, an, an award winning uh, correspondent uh, at E60 and outside the lines for ESPN. Uh, he's done seminal interviews over the years. Uh, and more than anything, though, as as Kenny said, he's just the, the ultimate mensch. We do a lot of people in media. Uh, and Jeremy really sets a high standard both for substance uh, and process and how he goes about doing things. So uh, very, very proud of the fact that uh, he's a long-term friend and uh, very grateful that you chose Pleasure to spend part of your, your Passover, your Passover uh, evening with us um, yes. and talking through some things. So um, I guess the first thing to, uh, to just sort of dive in about is, uh, you know, over time, I guess one of the questions people have is, I should say, I should start by saying, though, that as somebody who's only bar mitzvah to Temple Emanuel, I frequently have to consult with Matthew to figure out, like, Jewish stuff, because <laughs> not, not, I'm not as well-educated as he is, or well-versed. Well, we have those discussions, so yes, we bring it into, I guess, uh, I guess the one thing, which, which is a good segue, uh, when you look about some of the, the, some of the bigger topics that you've covered, um, where it was something where you had uh, just sort of even culturally the the background from a Jewish perspective uh, some of the you've been able to do stories about players like Julian Edelman and Nate Ebner uh, football players uh, Bobby Fischer um, Evan Kaufman you've written a book about Jesse Owens and the Berlin Olympics which dealt with obviously with uh, with Nazi issues you uh, did a whole story about Beitar uh, Jerusalem and the team there um, what are some of these ones that really stood out to you most where there was something that uh, appealed to you in a different way that you thought, okay, well, hey, I'm learning something a little different about myself or my background, or I'm, I'm feeling yeah. something different. I mean, a lot of those stories you mentioned, um, um, you know, about Jewish athletes, about issues in Israel, um, historical stuff that I've dealt with in the books that I've written, uh, you know, those, you know, those are things you feel deeply as someone who is Jewish. Um, and, and they add, you know, kind of a different element to it sometimes. Um, I, I've kind of cornered the market on stories about uh, Jewish guys who play for the New England Patriots. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned Julian Edelman and Nate Ebner. Um, Andre Tippett, one of the great uh, defensive players of his era. Uh, I don't believe he converted until after his playing career ended, but I know Andre as well. Uh, and I've gotten to know the Kraft family, or Jonathan and, and Robert anyway, uh, fairly well uh, over the years. Um, you know, it's, you know, th there are stories that touch you. Um, you know, I did a story now 15 years ago about Bobby Fischer, the chess champion. And that one was a different one, personal on a lot of different levels. Um, Bobby was someone who rejected his Jewishness and became, you know, um, a virulent anti-Semite. Um, and that was a story about, about him, about, uh, it was about my father as well, who was a famous sports journalist who was, uh, close to Bobby when he was growing up before he kind of tore himself away from most of the people he'd been close to uh, before he won the World Chess Championship in 1972. So that was a really interesting experience because I'm, I'm at this press conference in Iceland in 2005 and uh, Bobby Fischer is holding his press conference. He's just been granted citizenship in Iceland. He's been freed from prison in Japan and he goes there and um, he has this press event, which was unexpected, and then it kind of um, it kind of evolved into just this confrontation between the two of us, and a lot of it was, um, you know, he said some some things that were um, explicitly anti-Semitic, uh, you know, directing them at Jews in general, at my father in particular, um, I think at me in particular. It that was a different kind of, of moment. You know, growing up, um, as many of you have in New York City, um, you know, to, to be called out in that way, in a public way, um, confronting that, coming from someone who happened to, you know, also be, um, you know, it, it, um, from New York and also Jewish, it, it, was, uh, it was deeply personal. Um, 
you know, there are other stories where it's that there wasn't that kind of connection to me personally or to my father, but I don't know if you mentioned the story I did about Evan Kaufman, which I thought was one of the more interesting stories I've done over the years. Evan Kaufman, and his story says, there, there are so many, another story where there's so many layers to it. He was a professional hockey player from Minnesota uh, and the captain of the Gophers team, one of the great college hockey programs. If you know anything about college hockey, like Matthew and myself, we've already talked about college hockey here now a couple of times in the first few minutes. Um, and Evan, uh, his grandparents, at least on one side, escaped uh, or survived the Holocaust, and his great grandparents um, perished. Um, and he went to Germany to play, a kid from Minnesota went to play professionally in Germany in uh, the early 2000s. And because uh, his grandparents had been from Germany, he was eligible for German citizenship, which uh, he applied for and was granted and ultimately played for the German national hockey team, including at the World Championships in Sweden in 2012 when we were doing the story. So you can imagine, and I think at that time, and maybe still, he's, he was the only um, Jewish athlete um, to claim German citizenship, uh, whose family had been, uh, some of his family perished in the Holocaust and had escaped Germany after the war, come to the United States, who had then, uh, then um, become a German, become a German citizen and competed on an international stage for Germany. So that was, you know, we went to the synagogue in the town that his family was from. We spent time with him in Dusseldorf. And there were, you know, there's so many issues. I mean, it's hard to unpack uh, all those kinds of issues in a story um, that ultimately even uh, a long story by TV standards, 10 or 12 minutes is short. But that was, that was a fascinating one to me. You can imagine the um, emotional complexities and issues for somebody like Evan, who was very close to his grandfather, to then decide to become a German and to compete for Germany on the international stage. I was there in Stockholm for the world championships, you know, and Evan, Evan's on, on the ice, you know, with the German um, insignia and I believe flag on his uniform. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't happen often, um, you know, the, the stories I work in, um, somehow touch on, on Jewish issues or Jewish, you know, it happens, uh, but so those are some of the meaningful ones. Okay, when you're looking at the way that journalism has changed even in the past like 10 or 20 years, um, what are the things that really stand out to you? I mean, is it you finding it that, you know, you're one of the uh, few people that really both has the interest, uh, opportunity, and talent and capabilities to be able to share longer form, form stories? Well, that's, that's, that's very kind. Uh, I, I mean it. Is it something that you're finding that that's it's easier or harder to do that now? I know you did like the you did a piece on uh, uh, a documentary on Buster Douglas recently, um, right. and you've had the chance to sort of play with different forms. Which one do you enjoy most, and and what do you see as as being most relevant now? Well, I, I, I've been you know it, it's it's been um, I've been very fortunate because I've been at ESPN now for 27 years, almost 27 years, and. The, you know, when I started there, you know, there was this show that was on once a month, typically called Outside the Lines, which would take several, you know, one big topic and do a few stories about it. And that was really the extent, as far as I recall, kind of long form storytelling and journalism at the network. And, you know, as much of the rest of the industry has pulled back and there was a plethora of magazine shows a generation ago and they were on every night. Um, you know, many of them are no longer there. That kind of journalism has become um, prohibitively expensive uh, in some places. We've just kept adding ways to do it. I mean, now, you know, the shows that I, um, that I host or co-host, E60 Outside the Lines, you know, we're doing long form pieces every week, several of them. Uh, we have so much time to play with. You know, for, for many years, I was in the, the business of doing mostly daily sports television news reporting, which typically means a couple of minutes here, a couple of minutes there. 
Uh, my father worked in network television for 30 years. You know, a long piece was three minutes, a short piece was two minutes. Um, and, and I'm lucky now, I mean, we do these pieces on E60. I mean, they're typically now 20 minutes. I think I had a Vince Carter piece on last night or two nights ago that was 20 minutes. I did an hour on Drew Bledsoe that's been running a lot recently. Um, you know, there's a lot of room to fill recently. So. Well, yes, that's true. But those things all predated that. I mean, right. I think they're running a lot more now, obviously, because of, of the gaps in the schedule. But I've just been so lucky to be in a place where there is this premium on that kind of content. And I think we've gotten really good at it. You know, you mentioned the 30 for 30 that I co-directed last year, 42 to 1 about Buster Douglas. That was kind of a dream project, a story I always wanted to tell uh, in that kind of, uh, for that kind of platform at that length. Um, you know, and, and those, there aren't a lot of places where you can do that. So I've been, I've been very lucky. Um, and, you know, we just keep going longer and longer. I, I, I mean, in the early years, even the 60, which is the magazine show that I, I work on, um, we've been on the air now 13 years. And in the beginning, you know, a 12 minute piece was a long piece. Now, you know, it's not, you know, most shows have a piece that's more than 25 minutes in a couple of parts. And, and we're doing hours that, you know, I did a half hour. I, mean, I probably did five or six last year alone that were at least half an hour. Um, so, so, so you can mixing a little bit of, of sort of documentary and I guess uh, short form. What, let, let's talk a little bit about your time there. So who are the personalities that you, who are your colleagues that the on-air colleagues who you really enjoyed working with the most? I assume Bob Lee is at the top of your list. With well, Bob, you know, Bob uh, worked with Bob, who, you know, legendary figure at ESPN, uh, a great colleague, uh, a great friend, uh, worked together basically from the day I walked in the door in 1993, uh, working on projects with, with Outside the Lines. And um, uh, to co-host like what, what would people really, not know about bob lee that we should know or something well, about you know I, well i think you know it's interesting matthew because you know bob a little too um bob i think for a very long time you know was someone who was kind of reluctant to share much of his personality he was very straight news he wasn't being asked to offer opinion he was the conscience of the network he was a straight straight news um guy i mean you would see of course his personality but in the last several years, Bob really felt um, empowered uh, and encouraged to be Bob and to to be you know display his wit, um, which is significant. And um, and and we just had a lot more fun. It was a lot looser in the last few years, and we had a different format for it doing. Um, some of these shows for outside the lines, knee sixty. Bob's one of the greats. I mean, people. There's so many people I've been close to and I've learned from. Uh, Bob's at the top of the list. Colleagues of mine like Mark Schwartz and Tom Rinaldi and Chris Connolly, who are all gifted storytellers, um, do remarkable work. Um, my colleague Lisa Salters is another remarkable storyteller, an interviewer who, who gets so much out of uh, the subject she speaks to. Um, I, I mean, I admire um, so many of the people I work with. I'm so privileged to work with many. I mean, this sounds, um, you, you know, um, like it's just company speak, but but there are so many. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've dealt with, you, you, and I, you and I have dealt with each other on a few stories directly over time. Uh, we had one particular with, uh, with Manti Teo and uh, that whole experience with oh, yes. his girlfriend. I remember. Um, and, Yes. Um, so that was one where we were a little more creative, where you did a, uh, a off camera, but on the record interview with him. And I remember having a, a, a long experience with you there and you sort of agreeing yes. to different things. You, you also were someone who um, had recommended Jamel Hill to speak to, yes. uh, to Janae Rice, uh, Ray Rice's wife. And we yeah. had gone through that. And, and you know, so your judgment was there. You, you also were sharing the wealth. Um, among uh, other people. And I think for the people who are listening, um, a lot of the names Jeremy brought up are not people who were hosting SportsCenter. Bob Lee obviously did at one point, right. but it's, it's these people who, uh, but, but, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, I don't work in the scene, you know, I haven't spent as much time, but you know, 
guys that I've been close with, um, colleagues, you know. Well, well I, think, I, I think the point that I want to make is I want to encourage make, people to look for things by these other reporters and journalists because I think I, I'm, I brought them up because I think it's important that the people listening actually go and look for stories and yeah. pieces that are done by these other journalists because um, there is a lot of really good journalism going on there. Um, okay, so as we're getting a little bit into to current times, um, the obviously everything is uh, gets more politicized over time. Have you been, uh, obviously, Colin Kaepernick was the ultimate example of where politics entered sports. Um, I sort of view the world a little bit that everybody in politics wanted to be in entertainment and everybody in entertainment wanted to be in politics. And then you had sports and you had tech and you sort of have a whole world that way of everybody's in each other's business and affects each other to some degree. Um, have you have you been discouraged by the amount that politics gets into sports or is it something that you just sort of feel has always been there, but we may focus on it more now? No, I mean, you know, I think, um, I think, you know, that's, that's kind of our, uh, that's our territory, you know, when we're talking about outside the lines, you know, if you're working on, on sports center, um, you know, that is not, um, you know, typically the kind of stuff that gets covered the way that it does on outside the lines. Um, and, and, you know, when sports and society at large intersect, you know, we cover it. And the last few years have obviously been um, much more active in that space in terms of athletes and activism and politics. And, you know, everything's become politicized, right? Uh, in a way, in the last few years that we aren't necessarily accustomed to. But, you know, you got to cover it. It's, it's part of the story. Um, is that something you're, are you looking at any politically related stories right now of things that you have coming up? You know, right now I'm trying to think, what am I, you know, I, I wouldn't call it political. I'm thinking, you know, E60 stories are more kind of, you know, there's a long lead time and you spend a lot of time producing them and thinking about them. They're not really reacting to the moment. You know, that's more the kind of stuff that we do at Outside the Lines where, you know, we're talking about it in the moment, whatever's happening. Um, you know, one thing that's interesting that I'm working on right now for E60, um, I don't know how many of uh, the people who are listening right now remember Barry Rosen, but he was kind of, for many people, one of the faces of the hostage crisis in Iran from 1979 to, you know, January 20th, 1981. And he was a press attache uh, at, the, um, at the embassy in Tehran. He was one of the hostages for 444 days. And when he got home, like the other 51 hostages that he received from Major League Baseball lifetime pass to games, like a plus one, you know, good. And they'd only done that once before. I'm trying to remember. I, it might have been like Neil Armstrong or something like that. Um, maybe it was John Glenn. I'm, I'm, I, I, some, some, you know, something like that. But then uh, Bowie Kuhn, who was the commissioner of baseball at the time in 1981, gave all the hostages these lifetime passes. And so, like many of the stories I do, it's not really about sports. It's kind of tangentially about sports. The, the baseball pass does play a role in Barry's story when he gets home and he hasn't seen, he's got two young kids and he hasn't seen his wife in a while, obviously a while, you know, in a year and a half. Um, and, you know, it's a shattering experience. Uh, and he was a Mets fan uh, from Brooklyn, and that having that pass, being able to go to Mets games with his family in the 80s uh, helped him reconnect um, with his family, um, with life in America, uh, with his former self. And so that, that is part of the story, but it's also an opportunity to kind of just um, tell, you know, 40 years later with the 40th anniversary um, coming up, the story of the hostages and, and especially Barry, who's a remarkable guy. I don't know if you've ever dealt with him, but you know, he's a, he's a figure in academia in New York um, and, and uh, fascinating uh, learned guy. And, you know, he agreed to do this story and talk about his experiences, which were incredibly painful. Um, but let me ask you, that's just a rich story. When, when you're looking um, at sort of current things right now, um, what do you, uh, you're looking at the Tom Brady story, for example. Yeah. Um, how do you view why he? Get me an interview. To... Is there a way? Is there a way to get me an interview? I mean, I know we've got to work on that somehow, right? I'm, I, I'm the wrong I, guy. Gotta, I'm the gotta, wrong guy on that one. Um, I have not talked to Tom Brady since the day he replaced Drew Bledsoe officially. 
as and that's why you decided to do the Drew Bledsoe story, so. which is one of my favorite projects ever. Uh, okay. Bledsoe's <laughs> great. If you get a chance to watch the E60 on Drew Bledsoe, I think we called it Better with Age. Uh, if I do say so, I think it's pretty good. Well, Mo Lewis, uh, still, we're still living with the results of, I tried to, of, I, I of Mo Lewis to, taking him out. So, I spoke you know, to Mo uh, in the process. I wanted to interview him for the project. Mo Lewis is the Jets linebacker for everyone who's not an obsessive, crazy Jets fan like Matthew. Uh, he was the linebacker who knocked Drew Bledsoe out of the game the week after 9-11, and which opened the door for Brady. Yes. Um, so if you look at a couple of the other people you would want to interview now, who would be like, the top two or three people on your list now? Well, that, you know, um, since you're putting me on the spot, I would have to put Mr. Brady, number one. Um, Mr. Belichick, <laughs> number two. And uh, maybe Mr. Kraft, number three. Uh, they, I mean, that's, that's been the biggest story in sports uh, this year. Uh, uh, you know. There's some great stuff online. The death of Kobe Bryant that. Seth, is, is Seth something Wickersham. that's not a sports story. That's something bigger than that but in terms of on the field sports what's happening and you know uh Brady and Belichick and um and Kraft you know it's it's America's number one game not telling you guys anything you don't know and they're the three you know Belichick and Brady are the two key figures um you know the greatest dynasty in football history which is hard for someone to say who grew up as a fan of the Lombardi Packers, whose godfather played for the Lombardi Packers. My father wrote six books about those Packers. But, you know, when it was the Packers with five championships in seven seasons, you could make the case that that was greater than the Patriots five and 15. I mean, that's just math. But once they won the six, it was kind of hard to argue against the Patriots. So those, but, you know, not exclusively, those would be um, great people to talk to. Um, You know, I'd love to sit down and uh, before the Hall of Fame induction, talk with Derek Jeter. Uh, right now, I mean, you know. Well, it's a good connection, you know. The uh, didn't uh, Brady, I guess, is renting out his his house. That is true. So, so true. get them both. So there is, get there is that connection down there. Is it Tampa? It's Tampa. Now. Tampa, Tampa Bay. It's it's in the fact that it, Tom Brady decided to uh, try to get the uh, the trademarks on those yes. names. So it's a little it's a little. Try to with the the Tom um, terrific thing, but that didn't work out. Or he withdrew <laughs> it. He withdrew it. Um, so, so 